Ever since George Floyd was killed by police officers in Minneapolis back in May of 2020, there's been a massive uptick of interest in how the police do their jobs. However, for a former mayor of Toronto, reforming the police has been a mission he's been on for half a century. His latest contribution to that conversation is called Crisis in Canada's Policing, Why Change is So Hard and How We Can Get Real Reform in Our Police Forces. And the book's author, John Sewell, joins us now from the Witchwood neighborhood of the provincial capital. Mr. Sewell, it's always good to have you on our airwaves. How are you doing today? Terrific. I'm feeling fine, Steve. Nice Excellent. to be here. Let's start with this, because, and I guess a 30,000-foot view, if we can put it that way. You and the police seem to have a very different view of the role they play in society. They think they are the thin blue line that separates basically everybody from mayhem. Is that your view? No, I, I don't think that's the case. They're one element in society, but there's lots of other elements that, in fact, are being very protective of Canadian society and making it very safe. I mean, there is this notion that the police are out there fighting crime and so forth, but in fact, the data doesn't support that. The data shows that in Canada, the average police officer arrests 10 people a year. In Toronto, it's six people a year. So it's not as though they're dealing a lot with crime. They're dealing with actually a lot of other things. Uh, if you go to somewhere like Ottawa, only one out of 80 calls for service deal are, are considered uh, uh, priority one. That means they involve some kind of violence. The other 79 don't. It's this, again the same in Toronto, that 97% that, that of the calls for service don't involve violence. Now, so in your fact, view, I think we have a we have a misunderstanding of what the police do at the end of the day. Well, let me, let me just follow up with this. Are there so few arrests because there's not much crime happening, or is it because police find another way to resolve a situation without having to arrest anyone? No, I think it's because there's not very much crime happening. Um, you know, the data. I, I mean, if if you look at Toronto as an example, the data in Toronto shows that Toronto has one of the lowest rates of crime in all of Canada. I mean, there, there, there's just not a lot of it around. I think what's happened is we've got into the police of using them as a default mechanism for all sorts of other things that are happening in society, where we'd be much better off using other forces in society, other community agencies, to actually deal with those kinds of problems. Well, you do raise a number of interesting new ideas in your book, and I do want to, uh, well, let's touch on some of them here. You tell us that the police in London, UK, they police by, quote, consent, not force. They don't carry guns. Should we do that here? Yeah. Yes, we should be doing it here. As I say, 97% of the calls in Toronto, and I think that's true of most other cities, uh, large cities in Canada, don't deal with questions of violence at all. We don't need somebody going out there with a gun and a taser and, and body armor. It, it's not giving the right kind of message. I think we should reserve, reserve the guns for emergency task force. Simple as that. I think that would be a big gain. It would make the police much, people would feel much happier with police if they were not armed. I, I went to a, a high school, talking at high school last week um, about the police, and a number of students said, you know, when police are around, we feel more scared and more worried than if they weren't. And I think that's because they've got all these things, and, and they don't need them for most of the work that they do. For the 3%, though, of cases which could turn ugly and violent, if they did not have weapons, would their safety be in jeopardy? It might be, but I would send the emergency task force for those kinds of, of calls. There's no question about it. You know, in some cases, you are going to, 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 to need to, to have some ammunition and some guns and so forth. But there are very, very few uh, percentage numbers of the calls. All right, let's talk about training. Here's a quote from your book that I'd like to read. Nothing you write is more powerful as a training technique than isolating students for a period of time and subjecting them to a predetermined routine. What is it about how the police are trained that you think needs to change? Well, police are trained, for, first of all, they're all hired as generalists, not as people who know a lot about very difficult questions that must be resolved in society. But the second thing is we put them all as generalists in, in Ontario, we put them all into a school in Aylmer, Ontario, where they're trained for about a three-month period to all be police officers and rely on each other. So they pick up the police culture right there in the training. And I don't think that's very helpful at all. 
I think we'd be much better off if we looked at police in a fundamentally different way and say, this idea of starting everybody off as generalists and then training them as police officers to, to do various things is not the right approach. We would never do that for hospitals. It's not the way we hire doctors in hospitals. We shouldn't be doing it with the police. So that kind of training, I think, is, is not very effective at all. It, well, it's effective for creating a police culture, but that police culture doesn't serve you and I. Uh, one more idea from the book. Technically, legally, police services are supposed to come under civilian control. There's an oversight board, a police services board, that's supposed to uh, be offering direction. Do you think the police chafe at that kind of civilian oversight? I don't think it works very well. The oversight doesn't work. The police commissions, the police boards, at least in Ontario, and I think it's true across the country, are not very effective. They don't seem to 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 really bring police in line. The example I always give is the the city of Toronto, the the Toronto Police Services Board here. And uh, you know, in 2001, they were told by the Supreme Court of Canada they were strip searching many too many people. Well, they did nothing about it for year after year. They continued to strip more and more and more people until finally there was a government report in 2018 that said, you know, you're strip searching 40% of the people who were arrested when most of the other police forces in Ontario are strip searching 1% of the people arrested. Still, the police board in Toronto said, oh, well, we'll just leave it. It was only last year after the murder of George Floyd that, in fact, the police service board in Toronto said, oh, we're going to change our rules about strip searches. 19 years it took them. Well, that's not a good way for a police board to function. Well, we hope this has whetted people's interest to hear other voices uh, join us into this conversation. Uh, we have these and other ideas I think we want to discuss. So joining us now from London, Ontario, is Scott Blanford. He's assistant professor and public safety programs coordinator at Wilfrid Laurier University and a retired police officer himself. In Hamilton, Ontario, there's Frank Bergen. He is the chief of police for the Hamilton Police Service. And in the provincial capital, Nana Yanfel, who's the legal director at the Black Legal Action Centre. And we appreciate the three of you joining former Mayor John Sewell for this conversation about policing in Ontario in particular and in Canada in general today. Um, chief Bergen, let me start with you, and I'll pick up on that last uh, issue that uh, former Mayor Sewell and I were discussing. Civilian oversight of the cops, do they resent it? Of course we don't resent it, and, and we also should not diminish the amazing work that John Sewell has done for many years. And John, uh, you and I have a lot in common. I started policing in 1982 in the downtown core in Toronto, so I've seen you at many events. I've seen you certainly at the board, uh, and I think it's too easy also just to say that this conversation really has only begun since George Floyd. You've been having these conversations with policing and commissions and oversight for many, many years, and we thank you for that. It makes us better. With regards to um, police oversight, and, and you also finalize your actual last paragraph in your book that actually speaks about um, the reality of the role of the police service board, the role of the OIPRD and the SIU and the oversight. There's clear understanding in the regulations, certainly within strategic planning, but also within governance and oversight of police operations. Uh, it works. And it's about the uh, honest conversation. Your point, um, we are uh, accountable to our board. Our board is a civilian oversight, which is made up of municipal and provincial and designate people. Um, our board here in Hamilton has seven vibrant participants. Uh, our chair currently is our mayor, and that's uh, uh, until the end of this week coming up. So, uh, no, we do listen and we do not uh, discount the direction from our governor. Uh, Mr. Sewell, sounds like he's killing you with some kindness there. We'll get back to... Uh... We'll get back to some of your feedback on, on those comments from the Hamilton police chief in a second, but I want to bring Nana in here. Uh, we have been talking about the relationship between the police and various minority communities uh, in this and other cities for a very long time now. I think I interviewed John Sewell on his first policing book back in 1985 or something like that. Uh, is there any evidence that you see, Nana, that things are improving in that regard? Well, thank you so much, Steve, for having me. And I'd like to echo the police chief's comments about uh, Mr. Sewell. He has been a huge influence on my activism. Um, as a baby lawyer, I remember joining the Toronto Police Accountability Coalition and, and 
just loving that there was an opportunity to engage with like-minded folks. Um, I think in terms of, you know, whether or not it reflects the reality on the ground, at the Black Legal Action Center, we hear every day from our clients, members of our community who have been overly targeted, scrutinized, overcharged, um, brutalized by violence at the hands of the police. And so we are really concerned that policing often causes more harm to our communities. And I think to answer that question, we need to look at what the statistics tell us. What the stats say is quite important. Police are more likely to stop and search black people. They're more likely to charge our communities as compared to white folks. Um, They're more likely to arrest us and more likely to use force against, seriously injure and kill black people. And these are recent statistics. So um, in fact, I don't think that it is getting better. I think once we look at the statistics, we look at what's going on in the world um, and the impact in our communities, it's not getting better. So something really drastically needs to transform and change. Nana, is that the the statistics you're referring to, are those post-George Floyd statistics? Because we've certainly heard that there's a massive conversation going on right now, a real zeal for reform is in the air, and that things are changing. True or false? I think it depends on who you ask. What I'm saying is when we speak to our clients, we're hearing that it continues to happen. Those statistics are from the Ontario Human Rights Commission report from 2018 and 2020. And specifically about the use of force and the violence in our community, those are statistics from 2013 to 2017. So, um, you know, what is actually happening on the ground may be very different for some communities, but what we're hearing from our folks is that it's it's continuing to happening. We're still being over-criminalized, over-policed and overcharged. So that's what we're hearing on the ground. Scott, let me get your take on this. And you approach this, obviously, as an academic now, but as somebody who had plenty of time in a police service, so you bring that to it as well. What do you think of what John Sewell's saying? Well, I mean, it's really, uh, it, it's interesting, some of the comments he made. Uh, it, I'll start with the, the issue regarding firearms. Uh, I disagree. And I speak as a former uh, use of force instructor, as a tactical officer. And the Canadian uh, situation is such that uh, I, I believe we're somewhere between the American model, which is uh, hyper uh, vigilant towards firearms, and the UK model. And because of the 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 diversity within our country and, and the fact that we're spread out over such a large period of time, response time for officers to attend that are armed uh, could create a public safety issue, in my opinion. If just look to the situation that happened in Mayerthorpe. Uh, the situation in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. And those are situations where the police were outmatched uh, by suspects with firearms. And in those types of situations, I think an immediate response is required. And there just simply isn't a time to wait for a a response team to arrive upon scene. John Sully, you want to comment on that? Well, I I think in a large city, I'm not sure that that's entirely true. Um, You know, most of the calls that come in to the police, as I say, do not deal with violence. And it's clear on the telephone they don't. So those kinds of calls don't require somebody going out there with a gun and a taser and body armor. The calls that do, well, okay, I understand that. And I think that there's probably enough officers around in the the emergency task force to actually deal with those relatively quickly. Uh, So I, I, I think that in fact, trying some experiments with unarmed police officers would be a really, really good job. It would also save a lot of problems. I mean, we know the problems we've had about police responding to calls with people in mental crisis, where too often the gun gets pulled out and somebody gets shot. And that shouldn't be happening. Um, You know, the number of people who are killed in Canada by police officers every year is, is, you know, two or three dozen. Well, that shouldn't be happening. That shouldn't be happening. It's happening because officers have got guns. Chief Bergen, how would... We really have to rethink that. Right. Let me ask Chief Bergen if he'd be up for having the city of Hamilton and his police service be a pilot project, as Mr. Sewell has described it, to to try policing without weapons. No, I think that's too advanced uh, for us to actually commit to. What we do have to do is what Mr. Sewell had indicated. There are many calls that we are actually attending that we should not be the first responders. Uh, We have benefited from our relationships, both within mental health portfolios, uh, mobile crisis rapid response, social navigator programs, coast programs, where we are actually are partnering with our community and our social services, our our, um, triage nurses to do the calls. He is right in the sense that we should not always be bringing a gun to a situation that has the potential is not to be violent and escalate it. To also hear what our, our friend Nana has said about what some people's perceptions are of our actual appearance 
at the site. So before we get to a point where we have the comfort of understanding that we have to control the violence, and there is violence within the community. Uh, the other thing that I maybe uh, have some challenges with is Mr. Erickson's study, which is almost 50 years ago in the book that speaks about one call per day. Uh, that's just not the reality in Hamilton. Uh, that is not what our deployment model is about, but really what we should be talking about. Are, are we going to the calls that are truly police response, or is this a time to have a conversation yeah. about, in fact, who should be responding to certain calls? Let me, I do want to come back to that later, but I, I want to circle back right now to training because John Sewell talked about that as well, sending everybody off to Aylmer, Ontario, uh, isolated, uh, putting them through their paces out there and then sort of bringing them back to, if I can call it this, society. Um, okay, Nana, come on in here and say, the book suggests that there's a sort of a warrior psyche, an occupier's mentality that police are trained with. Do you see that? I mean, I, th I think we do. I think there is an us versus them built into police training and the way police operate. And it, it's it's not that surprising considering the history and the origin story of policing. I mean, in North America on Turtle Island, their role was slave patrols. So to control enslaved and Indigenous people, as Mr. Sewell mentions in his book. So I have difficulty with the conversation around training, to be honest, if I'm going to be frank. Um, how much more training do we need? We've waited long enough and having more training or more black officers and more gender diverse officers, it doesn't always equal freedom, justice and safety for us, period. And we've tried, we've given you training, we've given you cameras, we've said, sure, let's try more diversity on the force. But in that time, black people have continued to die. Baseless charges have been continued to lay. Um, a disproportionate number of black people are in jail, have lost jobs, educational opportunities, the list goes on and on. So. To be honest, I think these things, body cameras, training, all of these things are distractions. And I and I really like what Toni Morrison says about distraction. It's the very serious function of racism. Distraction is the very, very serious function of racism. And there'll always be one more thing. So I do have quite a bit of concerns about, about that conversation. Scott, let me get you to weigh in on how police are trained and whether that needs to change. Uh, I, I believe it does. Uh, I do agree with uh, some of the comments here. Uh, Police training is, is very traditionally entrenched. It, it follows almost an apprenticeship model. And what I believe, uh, and, and I agree with the comment, that police tend to be the catch-all for everything. And as a result, they have to be generalists because they're expected to respond at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, where I see uh, some benefit coming was if we looked at tiered policing, where we do have our uh, armed response officers who are dealing with the high-risk calls, who are dealing with sort of the mandated calls under the Police Services Act, and then have a special constable status or a tiered status officer that could be more community focused and community minded. Now, I really draw a connection between training and education. And the difference being training is telling them what to do, where education gives them the broader skill sets to understand and critically think why they're doing something. And there's been numerous studies that have shown that education for police officers, not training, but education, uh, is a factor in creating a greater understanding of diversity, uh, it, less propensity to use violence, and greater ability to critically think in community situations. So I think education is an important part of that, and that goes beyond training. So in that respect, I do uh, completely agree there needs to be some changes to that model. And one of my suggestions is that we need to have established a, a college of policing as an oversight body that can help set standards, set training and education requirements for officers, as well as dealing with the, the complaint process and the investigation of uh, uh, malfeasance by officers. Let me get Chief Bergen to weigh in on whether he thinks he is getting adequately trained officers to join his service once they've graduated from the police college. I absolutely do think we are, and I agree that was with Scott saying and what everybody is saying, it's your base entry level understanding of statute, of understanding your roles and responsibility, the core function of policing. But my goodness, uh, we, we have to agree that we learn every day. When we have a bad decision, a decision that reinforces what would be depicted as racial profiling, we have to understand articulable cause. We have to understand Charters 8, 9, and 10. If we didn't have these conversations, understand our ability to adapt, Problems, we wouldn't be talking about de-escalation. We wouldn't be able to understand, in fact, the use of force model. This is a continuum. These are not things that we can actually rest on our laurels to say that we've reached the destination. What really happened after George Floyd is a conversation shifted from the legitimacy of policing in the community. And we need to continue to have that. 
here in Hamilton across all of the province. We're committed to um, equity, diversity, inclusion. We're having the conversations with our members about what in fact their experiences are, the diversity both within and with our communities. After today's um, conversation, I'm now going to a community meeting to yet again, learn what we can do better. We are open to that, but it's just Scott saying, every day is education. Every opportunity and every interaction is making sure we can do better. It would be wrong for us to think that we in fact not learn from our bad mistakes. If we make mistakes, policing is messy. In reality, we have to listen to our critics. Yep, John Sewell, come on in. I mean, it's all, all well and good to talk about training, but in fact, what we, we haven't talked about is police culture. The police have a very distinct culture, which is very harmful to society. It's, it's racist. They literally, I mean, the, the data on that is overwhelming. Every city in Canada has been doing carding. And in fact, they, the carding clearly, as Nana's mentioned, discriminates against blacks and other people of color. I mean, it's straightforward. And the police boards and police services generally have said, hey, there's nothing wrong with it. We like doing carding. In fa and there's an extraordinary sexist uh, uh, discrimination happening in police forces. I mean, the report that they've made on the RCMP uh, by Mr. Justice Bastrash of the Supreme Court of Canada is absolutely shocking about how women have been dealt with by the RCMP and the Murdered and Missing Women Indigenous report, same thing. I mean, th these are really cultural issues that have to be addressed. And, and th there's a really good question as to whether police forces are capable of doing it. I mean, I, I think the other issue is the, the extent of the violence that happens with, in, you know, from police. And those are big issues, and I'm not sure training's ever going to get over them. I think we've got to do some restructuring where we have some very strong people at the top who are saying, we're going to start doing policing in different ways. Chief Bergen, I've got to give you a chance to respond to the question of the culture around policing and whether that's a big part of the problem. Yeah, and you even started off the program. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about about the thin blue line. And you talked about guardians and warriors, and we've had those conversations. And 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 they don't do anything to move the conversation forward. They don't do anything about actually being able to repair any of our culture. Uh, Peter Slowly, the chief of Ottawa, best described it as in fact it's not a thin blue line. It's actually a blue thread throughout society that allows us to understand what is our role. Uh, we are not the lead on many of the files that unfortunately we are the default, as Scott said, at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, we are prepared to understand and we take the years, not only of what Mr. Sewell has spoke about, but many of the oversights and the commissions and the reviews to understand that we have an ability and this is an opportunity, this is a great opportunity for us to continue to talk and to continue to understand how we can do policing better. Okay, let me get Scott in here because you heard John Sewell a moment ago say that the conduct of the RCMP throughout the time he's been watching this has from time to time been rather egregious. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, they were burning down barns for a variety of reasons. And now uh, when you look at what's happening in Western Canada, th there are some legitimate questions being asked about how they do what they do. There's a recommendation in John Sewell's book to simply shut the RCMP down and start again. Scott, what's your view on that? Hmm. That, that's an interesting uh, question because the, what do you do in the meantime while you're in the process of shutting down one organization and starting up another organization? The, the, section 91, Section 92 of the Constitution Act clearly delineate uh, the federal responsibility for policing uh, with Section 92 referring to the province's responsibility. So that's a federal level uh, decision and, and I mean, considering the size of the country and the resources available, uh, that would be a massive undertaking. Uh, the problem is, is that cultural change is, is either accomplished through periods of time, generational, or it's through uh, a shock factor where it, it's an immediate change. H how you would actually implement that, I don't really know. John Sewell, you want to give them some advice? Well, yeah. It, the recommendation that the RCMP should be disbanded was made by a royal commission in 2007. Mr. Justice Bastrash, in his report last year, said that the RCMP is not capable of changing its own culture, and maybe it should be disbanded. So this is not my recommendation. These are recommendations by two royal commissions. Now, I agree that you can't just disband a police force and not have anything. 
But, you know, and maybe some of the British Columbia cities are now talking about it. They don't want the RCMP. They'd rather have a municipal police force. So that would be one way of dealing with the situation. Nana, you want to come in? But in fact, the RCMP is a big, big problem. People better look at those reports. All yours, Nana. Thank you. Yes, I, I completely, I completely agree. Um, and it shouldn't be seen as a radical alternative or a radical solution. There are a myriad of other options of community-based, non-police um, options and uh, responses that are ready to go. Right? We just need to decide to make the change, um, and we need political will to do that. I mean, no other profession can continually harm, have disproportionate impacts on various communities, and refuse. I think this is what's so key: refuse to implement suggestions that are backed by evidence for improvement for decades and continue to get increases in their budget every year. It's just, it's unheard of. Okay, let me put a new issue on the table here because perhaps the most three famous words used in the last couple of years as it relates to the police are defund the police. And John Sewell's book has something to say about this. Um, That's a catchphrase that he'd like to see replaced by something called detask the police. And here is an excerpt from his book on that issue. Police could also be relieved of calls regarding the homeless, as has happened in Seattle. In Toronto, the homeless represent 360,000 calls a year, or 10% of all police contacts. These calls rarely involve violence. In Toronto, police issue some 16,000 tickets a year to the homeless for minor offenses, But given that homeless people do not have the means to pay those tickets, 90% are never paid, a criminal offense resulting in jail time. The cost to the police of this almost useless exercise is estimated at $100 million a year in Toronto. Chief, you got to weigh in on this and talk about whether or not you think you guys are doing things that really ought to better be done by others. And I can't, I can't help but agree. Everything that uh, John Sewell said with regards to detasking, uh, we are doing so many calls that we are not the lead or should be the lead on it. Homelessness, harm reduction, poverty, mental illness in our communities right now, our actual sudden death to overdose doses are year over year increase of 72%. The reality is encampments and homelessness and the challenge of not having an ability to house the people living rough, uh, we have to have a better way and a better approach. We have relied on what has been the social navigator and our coast program, as well as our MCERT or mobile crisis rapid response. But these are partnering with our social services, with our emergency triage nurses. The reality is we've also established what is a rapid intervention safety team, where we in fact are working with all our collaboration and our partners with social services to try and find a different approach. These people do not belong in jail. These people have to have the support and we have to be able to make sure we can meet their needs. Having police officers meeting that needs is not the right response. Scott, what should the police no longer be doing that they currently are? Well, I completely agree with with this entire uh, thread of conversation. Police have been tasked with, uh, you know, everything from uh, active shooter situations to parking and parking dog uh, complaints. I think there needs to be a return back to the core services that police are required to provide under the Police Services Act. And there needs to be more investment at the community level for the various infrastructures that are required to deal with these types of issues. If you look back to the deinstitutionalization of the mental health facilities back in the early 2000s and what that created on the street for officers has driven up the calls for service. I, I think there needs to be a return back to the core services for police and again, I come back to that tiered policing where you could have other community members, whether they're special constables or community teams uh, that are working to deal with these other issues that are not violent in nature, not uh, criminal in nature, and relieve that burden. But before you can do that, you have to make sure you have the infrastructures in place to take over these tasks that the police are currently doing. Nana, defund or detask the police? I mean, I see these two as uh, hand in hand, right? You detask, you need the resources, um, as was just mentioned, you need the resources to actually fund these things. So we know policing can't be the only response to crisis, right? When we, when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? That saying goes. So uh, we need to strategically, um, you know, reallocate these funds to civilian-led alternative response models. And as I mentioned before, there are many options that are ready to go. We just need the political will to do it. Okay, John. John, so on the political, sure. on the on the political will, Steve. This is where police boards would be really helpful, but they are not. 
No police board that I know is saying, yep, we've got to get into that. In Toronto City Council, as an example, it said we want to get police out of calls to those in mental crisis. And we, we want that change to happen. The Toronto Police Board, what's it done? It's expanded the amount of money it's spending for those kinds of calls. I mean, you know, come on now. So we've got to have stronger police boards that actually take their job seriously. How do you make that happen? Well, we've got to have fundamentally different appointees to those boards. Instead of having people whose job is just to sit there and not do anything reasonable, we've got to get some different people. I, I suggest in the book that we actually get a whole bunch of people who are on the receiving end, people in the black and minority communities, um, and, and people who are very activists, to sit down and make some recommendations about who should be on police boards. Well, that's what we have to do. John Sewell, I've known you a long time. I remember... 40 years ago, when uh, Toronto police shot and killed a mentally handicapped black man named Albert Johnson, you were pilloried at the time um, for um, criticizing the police, and it no doubt contributed to the fact that you lost the mayoralty at the time. This was in 1980. Was there anything in your judgment positive that emerged from all of that? Well, what I did was I raised the question of, the, of trying to change police and asking the police commission, as it was called at the time, to actually begin changing policies about various things. And it did not. I managed to convince the provincial government to institute um, a complaints process that was independent of police. And that existed from 1980 until uh, Mike Harris killed it in the, in the late 1990s. Um, but that was about it. I mean, I, I, you know, I was vilified for speaking about the, the, the fact that it was wrong for police to be breaking somebody's door down and, and shooting a, a black man to death, you know, in front of his children. I, and I was vilified for that. Would you um, agree that a, that a police chief coming on this program all these years later and saying as many times as he did, I agree with John Sewell on X, Y and Z, does that constitute progress in your view? Well, I like it. I like it. Thank you, Frank, for saying those kinds of things. Uh, but in fact, we, you know, one police chief isn't going to change the world. Maybe he can start to change the world, but we've got to have some very strong change all over the place. And it has to happen at the provincial level, too. I mean, just to, I know one thing the, 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 the chief um, Bergen would agree with is we've got to get rid of this idea that you can only suspend a police officer who's done something wrong if that police officer is fully paid. That's wrong. We need a change in provincial legislation to do that. They do that in Alberta now. In Alberta, police chiefs have the ability to suspend an officer without pay. The policing has not collapsed there. But we need the provincial government to get in and make those kinds of changes. And I know that's something that, that virtually every police chief in Ontario would agree with. I mean, we're on the same page on that one. I know another thing the chief of police of Hamilton would agree with, and that is he doesn't want to be late for his next meeting, which he will be if we continue this conversation. <laughs> so I thank John Sewell for appearing on the program tonight, his latest book, Crisis in Canada's Policing. Nana Yanfel, Frank Bergen, Scott Blanford, my thanks to the three of you as well for joining us tonight on TVO. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.